Good afternoon. This is Pamela, and you are listening to Watchmen on the Pod. We are going to dig back in to 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Charles China Kwai, and we are on, or in, I should say, Chapter 48. The journey from Detroit to Chicago in the month of June, 1851, was not so pleasant as it is today. The Michigan Central Railroad was completed then only to New Buffalo. We took the steamer there and crossed Lake Michigan to Chicago, where we arrived the next morning after nearly perishing in a terrible storm. On the 15th of June, I first landed with the greatest difficulty on a badly wrecked wharf at the mouth of the river. Some of the streets I had to cross in order to reach the bishop's place were almost impassable. In many places, those loose planks had been thrown across them to prevent people from sinking in the mud and quicksands. The first sight of Chicago was then far from giving an idea of what that city has become in 1884. Though it had rapidly increased the last 10 years, its population was then not much more than 30,000. The only line of railroad finish was from Chicago to Aurora, after 40 miles, the whole population of the state of Illinois was then not much beyond 200,000. Today, Chicago alone numbers more than 500,000 souls within her limits. Probably more grain, lumber, beef, and pork are now bought and sold in a single day in Chicago than were then in a whole year. When I entered the miserable house called the Bishop's Palace, I could hardly believe my eyes. The planks of the lower floors in the dining room were floating, and it required a great deal of ingenuity to keep my feet dry while dining with him in the first room. But the Christian kindness and courtesy of the bishop made me more happy in his poor house than I felt later in the white marble palace built by his haughty successor, C. Regan. <clears throat> There were then in Chicago about 200 French-Canadian families under the pastorate of the Reverend M. A. LaBelle, who, like myself, was born in Kamaruska. The drunkenness and other immoralities of the clergy pictured to me by that priest surpassed all that I had ever heard, ever heard known. After getting my promise that I would never reveal the fact before his death, he assured me, that the last bishop had been poisoned by one of his grand vicars in the following way. He said the grand vicar, being father confessor of the nuns of Loretto, had fallen in love with one of the so-called virgins, who died a few days after becoming the mother of a stillborn child. This fact, having transpired and threatened to give a great deal of scandal, the bishop thought it was his duty to make an inquest and punish his priest, if he should be found guilty. The Grand Vicar, seeing that his crime was to be easily detected, found that the shortest way to escape exposure was to put an end to the inquest by murdering the poor bishop. A poison very difficult to detect was administered, and the death of the prelate soon followed, without exciting any surprise in the community. Horrified by the long and minute detail of that mystery, of iniquity, I came very near returning to Canada immediately, without going any further. But after more mature consideration, it seemed to me that these awful iniquities on the part of the priest of Illinois was just the reason why I should not shut my eyes to the voice of God if it were his will that I should come to take care of the precious souls he would trust to me. I spent a week in Chicago lecturing on temperance every evening and listening during the days to the grand plans the bishop was maturing <clears throat> in order to make our Church of Rome the mistress and ruler of the magnificent valley of the Mississippi, which included the states of Minnesota, Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, Mississippi, etc. He clearly demonstrated to me that once mistress of the inoculable treasures of those rich lands through the millions of her obedient children, our church would easily command the respect and the submission of the less favored states of the East. My zeal for my church was so sincere that I would have given with pleasure every drop of my blood in order to secure to her such a future of power and greatness. I felt really happy and thankful to God that he should have chosen me to help the Pope and the bishops realize such a noble 
and magnificent project. Leaving Chicago, it took me nearly three days to cross that vast prairies, which were then a perfect wilderness between Chicago and Bourbonus, where I spent three weeks in preaching and exploring the country, extending from the Kanakoki, Kanakaki River to the southwest towards the Mississippi. It was only then that I plainly understood the greatness of the plains of the bishop and that plans, I'm sorry, not plains. Let me redo that. It was only then that I plainly understood the greatness of the plans of the bishop and that I determined to sacrifice the exalted position God had given me in Canada to guide the steps of the Roman Catholic immigrants from France, Belgium, and Canada towards the region of the West in order to extend the power and influence of my church all over the United States. On my return to Chicago in the second week of July, all was arranged with the bishop of my coming back in the autumn to help him to accomplish his gigantic plans. However, it was understood between us that my leaving Canada for the United States would be kept a secret till the last hour on account of the stern opposition I expected from my bishop. The last thing to be done on my return to Canada in order to prepare the immigrants to go to Illinois rather than any part of the United States, any other part of the United States, was to tell them through the press the unrivaled advantages which God had prepared for them in the West. I did so by letter, which was published not only by the press of Canada, but also in many papers of France and Belgium. The importance of that letter is such that I hope my readers will bear with me in reproducing the following extracts from it. Montreal, Canada East, August 13, 1851. It is impossible to give our friends by narration an idea of what we feel when we cross for the first time the immense prairies of Illinois. It is a spectacle which must be seen to be well understood. As you advance in the midst of these boundless deserts where your eyes perceive nothing but lands of inexhaustible richness remaining in the most desolating solitude, you feel something which you cannot express by any word. Is your soul filled with joy or your heart broken by sadness? You cannot say. You lift up your eyes to heaven and the voice of your soul is chanting a hymn of gratitude. Tears of joy are trickling down your cheeks and you bless God, whose curse seems not to have fallen on the land where you stand. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Thorns also and th thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Genesis chapter 3, 17 and 18. You see around you the most luxuriant verdure, flowers of every kind, and magnificent above description. But if in the silence of meditation you look with new attention on those prairies, so rich, so magnificent, you feel an inexpressible sentiment of sadness, and addressing yourself to the blessed land, you say, Why art thou so solitary? Why is the wild game alone here to glorify my God? And if you continue to advance through those immense prairies, which, like a boundless ocean, are spreading the rolling waves before you, and seem to long after the presence of man to cover themselves with incalculable treasures, you remember your friends in Canada, and more particularly those among them who, crushed down by misery, are watering with the sweat of their brow a sterile and desolated soil, you say, ah, if such and such of my friends were here, how soon they would see their hard and ungrateful labors changed into the most smiling and happy position. Perhaps I will be accused then of trying to depopulate my country and drive my countrymen from Canada to the United States. No, no, I never had so perverse a design. Here is my mind about the subject of immigration, and I see no reason to be ashamed of it or to conceal it. It is a fact that a great number, and much greater than generally believed, of French Canadians are yearly immigrating from Canada, and nobody regrets it more than I do. But as long as those who govern Canada will not pay more attention to that evil, it will be an incurable one, and every year Canada will lose thousands and thousands of its strongest arms and noblest hearts to benefit our happy neighbors. With many others, I had the hope that the eloquent voice of the poor settlers of our eastern townships would be heard, and that the government would help them. But that hope is gone like a dream, and we now have every reason to fear that our unfortunate settlers of the East will be left to themselves. 
The greatest part of them for the want of roads to the markets of Quebec and Montreal, and still more by the tyranny of their cruel landlords, will soon be obliged to bid an external adieu to their country, and with an enraged heart against their haughty oppressors, they will seek in exile to a strange land the protection they could not find in their own country. Yes, if our Canadian government continues a little longer to show the same incomprehensible and stupid apathy for the welfare of its own subjects, immigration will increase every year from Canada to swell the ranks of the American people. Since we cannot stop the immigration, is it not our first duty to direct it in such a way that it will be, to the poor immigrants, as beneficial as possible? Let us do everything to hinder them from going to the large cities of the United States, drowned in the mixed population of American cities. Our unfortunate immigrating countrymen would be too much exposed to losing their morality and their faith. Surely there is not another country under the heavens where space, bread, and liberty are so universally assured to every member of the community as the United States. <clears throat> but... It is not in the great cities of the United States that our poor countrymen will sooner find these three gifts. The French Canadian who will stop in the large cities will not, with a very few exceptions, raise himself above the unenviable un position of a poor journeyman. But those among them who will direct their steps toward the rich and extensive prairies of Bourbonus will certainly find a better lot. Many in Canada would believe that I am exaggerating where... I to publish how happy, prosperous, and respectable is the French Canadian population of Bourbonus. The French Canadians of Bourbonus have had the intelligence to follow the good example of the industrious American farmer in the manner of cultivating the lands. On their farms, as well as on those of their neighbors, you will find the best machinery to cut their crops, to thresh their grain. They enjoy the just reputation of having the best horses of the country, and very few can beat them for the number and quality of their cattle. Now, what can be the prospect of a young man in Canada if he has not more than $200? A whole life of hard labor and continued privation is his too certain lot. But let that young man go directly to Bourbonus, and if he is industrious, sober, and religious, before a couple of years he will see nothing to envy in the most happy farmer of Canada. As the land he will take in Illinois is entirely prepared for the plow, he has no trees to cut or eradicate, no stones to move, no ditch to dig. His only work is to finch fence and break his land and sow it and the fur and the very first year the value of the crop will be sufficient to pay for his farm holy providence has prepared everything for the benefit of the happy farmers of illinois that fertile country is well watered by a multitude of rivers and large creeks whose borders are generally covered with the most rich and extensive groves of timber of the best quality as black oak maple white oak burr oak ash etc the seeds of the beautiful ikea locust after six or five or six years will give you a splendid tree the greatest variety of fruits are growing naturally in almost every part of Illinois. Coal mines have been discovered in the very heart of the country, more than sufficient for the wants of the people. Before long, a railroad from Chicago to Bourbonus will bring our happy countrymen to the most extensive market, the Queen City of the West, Chicago. I will then say to my young countrymen who intend emigrating from Canada, my friend, exile is one of the greatest calamities that can befall a man. Young Canadian, remain in the country. Keep thy heart to love it, thy intelligence to adorn it, and thine arms to protect it. Young and dear countrymen, remain in thy beautiful country. There is nothing more grand and sublime in the world than the waters of the St. Lawrence. It is on its deep and majestic waters that long before Europe and America will meet and bind themselves together to each other, by the blessed bonds of eternal peace, it is on its shores that they will exchange their incalculable treasures. Remain in the country of thy birth, my dear son. Let the sweat of thy brow continue to fertilize it, and let the perfume of thy virtues bring the blessing of God upon it. But, my dear son, if thou hast no more room in the valley of the St. Lawrence, and if by the want of protection from the government, 
Thou canst not go to the forest without running the danger of losing thy life in a pond, or being crushed under the feet of an English or Scotch tyrant. I am not the man to invite thee to exhaust thy days for the benefit of the insolent strangers who are the lords of the eastern lands. I will sooner tell thee, go my child. There are many extensive places still vacant on the earth, and God is everywhere. That great God calleth thee to another land. Submit thyself to his divine will. But before you bid a final adieu to thy country, engrave on thy heart and keep as a holy deposit the love of thy holy religion, of thy beautiful language, and of the dear and unfortunate country of thy birth. On thy way to the land of exile, stop as little as possible in the great cities, for fear of many snares thy eternal enemy has prepared for thy perdition. But go straight to the Barabanus, where they, there you will find many of thy brothers who have erected the cross of Christ. Join themselves, join thyself to them. Thou shalt be strong of their strength. Go and help them to conquer the gospel of Jesus. Those rich countries, which shall very soon weigh more than is generally believed in the balance of the nations. Yes, go straight to Illinois. Thou shalt not be entirely in a strange and alien country. Holy Providence has chosen thy fathers to find that rich country and to reveal to the world its admirable resources. More than once, that land of Illinois has been sanctified by the blood of thy ancestors. In Illinois, thou shalt not make a step without finding indestructible proof of the perseverance, genius, bravery, and piety of the French forefathers. Go to Illinois and the many names of Bourbonis, Joliet, Dubacu, La Salle, St. Charles, St. Mary, etc., that you will meet everywhere, will tell you more than my words, that that country is nothing but the rich inheritance which your fathers have found for the benefit of their grandchildren. See China Clyde. I would have... I would never have published this letter if I had foreseen its effect on the farmers of Canada. And a few days after its appearance, their farms fell to half their value. Everyone in some parishes wanted to sell their lands and immigrate to the West. It was only for want of purchasers that we did not see an immigration which would have surely ruined Canada. I was frightened by its immediate effect on the public mind. However, while some were praising me to the skies for having published it, Others were cursing me and calling me a traitor. The very day after its publication, I was in Quebec where the bishops of Canada were met in council. The first one I met was my Lord de Charbonneau, Bishop of Toronto. After having blessed me, he pressed my hand in his and said, I have just read your admirable letter. It is one of the most beautiful and eloquently written articles I have ever read. The Spirit of God has surely inspired every one of its sentences. I have just now forwarded six copies of it to different journals of France and Belgium, where they will be pub republished and do an incalculable amount of good by directing the French-speaking Catholic immigrants towards a country where they will run no risk of losing their faith with the assurance of securing a future of unbounded prosperity for their families. Your name will be put among the names of the greatest benefactors of humanity. Though these compliments seem to me much exaggerated and unmerited, I cannot deny that they please me by adding to my hopes and convictions that great good would surely come from the plan I had of gathering all the Roman Catholic immigrants on the same spot to form such large and strong congregations that they would have nothing to fear from heretics. I thanked the bishop for his kind and friendly words and left him to go and present my respectful salutations to Bishop Burgett of Montreal and give him a short sketch of my voyage to the far west. I found him alone in his room in the very act of reading my letter. A lioness, who had just lost her whelps, would not have broken upon me with more anger and threatening eyes than that bishop did. Is it possible, he said, Mr. Chinaquai, that your hand has written and signed such a perfidious document? How could you so cruelly pierce the bosom of your own country after her dealing so nobly with you? Do you not see that your treasonable letter will give such an impetus to immigration that our most thriving par parishes will soon be turned into solitude. Though you do not say it, we feel at every line of that letter that you will leave your country to give help and comfort to our natural enemies. 
surprised us by this unexpected burst of bad feeling, I kept my saying forward and answered, My lord, your lordship has surely misunderstood me if you have found in my letter my treasonable plan to ruin our country. Please read it again, and you will see that every line has been inspired by the purest motives of patriotism and the highest views of religion. How is it possible that the worthy Bishop of Toronto should have told me that the Spirit of God himself had directed every line of that letter when my good bishop's opinion is so completely opposite? The above answer the bishop gave to these remarks clearly indicated that my absence would be more welcome than my presence. I left him after asking his blessing, which he gave me in the coldest manner possible. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the 25th of August, I was back in Longueuil from my voyage to Quebec, which I had extended as far as Camarosca, to see again the noble-hearted parishioners whose unanimity in taking the Pledge of Temperance and admirable fidelity in keeping it then had filled my heart with such joy. I related my last interview with Bishop Burgett to my faithful friend, Mr. Broussard. He answered me, The present bad feelings of the Bishop of Montreal against you are not a secret to me. Unfortunately, the low-minded men who surrounded and counsel him are as unable as the Bishop himself to understand your exalted views in directing the steps of the Roman Catholics toward the splendid valley of the Mississippi. They are besides themselves because they see that you will easily succeed in forming a grand colony of French-speaking people in Illinois. Now, I am sure of what I say, though I am not free to tell you how it came to my knowledge. There is a plot somewhere to dishonest and destroy you at once. Those who are at the head of that plot hope that if they can succeed in destroying your popularity, nobody will be tempted to follow you to Illinois. For though you have concealed it as well as you could, it is evident to everyone now that you are the man selected by the bishops of the rest to direct the uncertain steps of the poor immigrants toward those rich lands. Do you mean, my dear Mr. Brassard, I replied, that there are priests around the Bishop of Montreal, cruel and vile enough to forge calumnies against me and spread them before the country in such a way that I shall be unable to refute them? It is just what I mean, answered Miss Broussard. Mind what I tell you, the bishop has used, has made use of you to reform his diocese. He likes you for that work, but your popularity is too great today for your enemies. They want to get rid of you, and no means will be too vile or criminal to accomplish your destruction if they can attain their object. But, my dear Mr. Broussard, can you give me any details of that plot which are in store against me, I asked? No, I cannot, for I know them not. But be on your guard, for your few but powerful enemies are jubilant. They speak of the absolute impotency to which you will soon be reduced if you accomplish what they so maliciously and falsely call your treacherous objects. I answered, Our Savior has said to all disciples, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. John chapter 16, verse 33. I am more determined than ever to put my trust in God and to fear no man. Two hours after this conversation, I received the following from Reverend M. Pear, secretary to the bishop. To the Reverend Mr. Chinacroy, apostle of temperance. My dear sir, my Lord Bishop of Montreal would like to see you upon some important business. Please come at your earliest convenience. You're truly, Pere Secretary. The next morning I was alone with the Monsignor Borgad, who received me very kindly. He first, he seemed at first to have entirely banished the bad feelings he had shown me in our last interview at Quebec. After making some friendly remarks on my continual labors and, and success in the cause of temperance, he stopped for a moment and seemed embarrassed how to resume the conversation. At last, he said, Are you not the father, confessor of Mrs. Chenier? Yes, my lord. I have been her confessor since I lived in Languil. Very well, very well, he rejoined. I suppose that you know that her only child is a nun in the congregation covenant. Yes, my lord, I know it, I replied. Could you not induce Mrs. Chenier to become a nun also? asked the bishop. I never thought of that, my lord, I answered, and I did not see why I should advise her to exchange her beautiful cottage, washed by the fresh and pure waters of the St. Lawrence, where she looked so happy and cheerful for the gloomy walls of the nunnery. 
but she is still young and beautiful. She may be deceived by temptations when she is there. Is that beautiful house surrounded by all the enjoyments of her future fortune? replied the bishop. I understand your lordship. Yes, Mrs. Turner has the reputation of being rich, though I know nothing of her fortune. She has kept well the charms and freshness of her youth. However, I think that the best remedy against the temptations you seem to dread so much for her is to advise her to marry. A good Christian husband seems to me a much better remedy against the dangers to which your lordship alludes when the cheerless walls of a nunnery than the cheerless walls of a nunnery. You speak just as a Protestant, rejoined the bishop, with an evident nervous irritation. We remark that, though you hear the confessions of a great number of young ladies, there is not a single one of them who has ever become a nun. You seem to ignore that the vow of chastity is the shortest way to life, to a life of holiness in this world and happiness in the next. I am sorry to differ from your lordship in that matter, I replied, but I cannot help it. The remedy you have found against sin is quite modern. The old remedy offered by God himself is very different and much better, I think. It is not good that the man should be should live alone. I will make and help meet for him, Genesis 2, verse 18, said our creator in the earthly paradise. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, said the same God through his apostle Paul. I know too how well how the great majority of nuns keep their vows of chastity to believe that the modern remedy against the temptations you mentioned is an improvement on the old one found and given by our God, I answered. With an angry look, the bishop replies, This is Protestantism, Mr. China Wright. This is sheer Protestantism. I respectfully ask your pardon for differing from your lordship. This is not Protestantism. It is simply and absolutely the pure word of God. But, my lord... God knows that it is my sincere desire, as it is my interest and duty to do all in my power to deserve your esteem. I do not want to vex nor disobey you. Please give me a good reason why I should advise Mrs. Chanier to in enter a monastery, and I will comply with, you, with your request the very first time she com comes to confess. Reserving, I'm sorry. Resuming his most amiable manner, the bishop answered me, My first reason is the spiritual good which she should she would receive from her vows of perpetual chastity and poverty in a nunnery. The second reason is that the lady is rich and we are in need of money. We would soon possess her whole fortune, for her only child is already in the congregate covenant. My dear bishop, I replied, you already know that what I think of your first reason, after having investigated that fact in the Protestant books, but from the lips of the nuns themselves, as well as from their father confessors, I am fully convinced that the real virtue of purity is much better kept in the homes of our Christian mothers, married sisters, and female friends than in the secret rooms, not to say prisons, where the poor nuns are enchained by the heavy fetters assumed by their vows, which the great majority curse when they cannot break them. And for the second reason, your lordship gives me to induce Mrs. Chenier becoming a nun. I am again sorry to say that I cannot consciously accept it. I have not consecrated myself to the priesthood to deprive respectful families of their legal inheritance in order to enrich myself or anyone else. I know she has poor re relation who need her fortune after her death. Do you pretend to say that your bishop is a thief? Angrily rejoined the bishop. No, my lord, by no means. No doubt for your high standpoint of view, your lordship may see things in a different aspect from what I see them in the low position I occupy in the church. But as your lordship is bound to follow the dictates of his conscience and everything, I also feel obligated to give heed to the voice of mine. This painful conversation had already lasted too long. I was anxious to see the end of it, for I could hardly, I could easily see in the face of my superior that every word I uttered was sealing my doom. I rose up to take leave of him and said, My lord, I beg your pardon for disappointing your lordship. He coldly answered me, It is not the first time, though I would, it were the last, that you show such a want of respect and submission to the will of your superiors. But... As I feel, it is a con conscientious affair on your part. I have no ill will against you, and I am happy to tell you that I, I entertain for you 
all my past esteem. The only favor I ask from you just now is that this conversation may be kept secret. I answered, it is still more to my interest that you that you're to keep this unfortunate affair a secret between us. I hope that neither your lordship nor the great God who alone has heard us will ever make it an imperious duty for me to mention it. What good news do you bring me from the bishop's palace? asked my venerable friend, Mr. Broussard, when I returned late in the evening. I would have very spicy, though unpalatable news to give you had not the bishop asked me to keep what was said between us a secret. Mr. Broussard laughed outright at my answer and replied, A secret, a secret, ah, but it is, it is a gazette secret, for the bishop has bothered me as well as many others with that matter, frequently since your return from Illinois. Several times he has asked us to persuade you to advise your devoted penitent, Mrs. Chenier, to become a nun. I knew he invited you to his palace yesterday for that object. The eyes and heart of our poor bishop, continued, Mr. Broussard, are too firmly fixated on the fortune of that lady, hence his zeal about the salvation of her soul through the monastic life. In vain I tried to dissuade the bishop from speaking to you on that subject, on account of your prejudice against our good nuns. He would not listen to me. No doubt you have realized my worst anticipations. You have, with your usual stubbornness, refused to yield to his demands. I fear you have added to his bad feelings and consummated your disgrace." What a deceitful man that bishop is, I answered indignantly. He has given me to understand that this was a most sacred secret between him and me, when I see by what you say that it is nothing else than a farcical secret known by the hundreds who have heard of it. But please, my dear Mr. Broussard, tell me, is it not a burning shame that our nunneries are chained into real traps to steal, cheat, and ruin so many unsuspecting families. I have no words to express my disgust and indignation when I see that all those great demonstrations and eloquent tirades about the perfection and holiness of the nuns on the part of our spiritual rulers are nothing else in reality than a veil to conceal their stealing operations. Do you not feel that those poor nuns are the victims of the most stupendous system of swindling the world has ever seen? I know that there are some honorable exceptions. For instance, the nunnery you have founded here is an exception and is an exception. You have not built it to enrich yourself as you have spent your last cent in its erection, but you and I are only simpletons who have till now ignored the terrible secrets which put that machine of nunneries and monkeries in motion. I am more than ever disgusted and terrified, not only by the unspeakable corruptions, but also by the stupendous system of swindling, which is their foundation stone. If the cities of Quebec and Montreal could know what I know of the incalculable sums of money secretly stolen through the confessional to aid our bishop in building the famous cathedrals and splendid palaces, or to cover themselves with robes of silk, satin, silver, and gold, to live more luxurious than the pahas of Turkey, they would set fire to all those palatial buildings. They would hang the confessors who have thrown the poor nuns into their dungeons under the pretext of saving their souls when the real motive was to lay hands on their inheritance and raise their colossal fortunes. The bishop has opened before me a most deplorable and shameful page of the history of our church. It makes me understand many facts which were a mystery to me till today. Now I understand the terrible wrath of the English people in the days of old, and of the French people were more recently, when they so violently wrenched from the hands of the clergy the enormous wealth they had accumulated during the Dark Ages. I have condemned those nations till now, but today I absolve them. I am sure that those men, though blind and cruel in their vengeance, were the ministers of the justice of God. The God of heaven could not forever tolerate a sacrilegious system of swindling, as I know now to be in operation from one end to the other, not only of Canada, but of the whole world under the mask of religion. I know that the bishop and his flatteries will hate and persecute me for my stern opposition to his rapacity, but I do feel happy and proud of his hatred. The God of truth and justice, the God of the gospel, will be on my side when they attack me. I do not fear them. 
let them come. That bishop surely did not know me when he thought that I would consent to be the instrument of hypocrisy, and that under the false pretext of a delusive perfection, I would throw that lady into a dungeon for her life, that he might become rich with her inheritance. Mr. Broussard answered me, I cannot blame you for your disobeying the bishop in this instance. I foretold him what has occurred, for I knew what you think of the nuns, though I do not go so far as you in that, I cannot absolutely shut my eyes to the fact which stare us in the face. Those monkish communities have in every age been the principal cause of the calamities which have befallen the church. For their love of riches, their pride and laziness, with their other scandals, have always been the same. Had I been able to foresee what has occurred inside the walls of the nunnery I built up here, I never would have erected it. However, now that I have built it, it is as a child of my old age. I feel bound to support it to the end. This does not prevent me from being afflicted when I see the facility with which our poor nuns yield to the criminal desires of their too weak confessors. Who could have thought, for instance, that their lean and ugly superior of the oblates, Father Ellard, could have fallen in love with his young nuns, that so many would have lost their hearts on his account. Have you heard how the young men of our village, indignant at his spending the greater part of that night with the nuns, have whipped him when he was crossing the bridge, not long before his leaving Longwill in Africa? It is evident that our bishop multiplies too fast those religious houses. My fear is that they will sooner than we expect, bring upon our Church of Canada the same cataclysm which have so often desolated her in England, France, Germany, and even in Italy. The clock struck twelve just when his last sentence fell from the lips of Mr. Broussard. It was quite time to take some rest. When leaving me for his sleeping room, he said, My dear Chanaquai, gird your loins well, sharpen your sword for the impending conflict. My fear is that the bishop and his adversaries, or his advisers, will never forget your wrenching from their hands the booty they were coveting so long. They will never forgive the spirit of independence with which you have rebuked them. In fact, the conflict has already begun. May God protect you against the open blues, the secret machine, machinations they have in store for you. I answered him. I do not fear them. I put my trust in God. It is for his honor I am fighting and suffering. He will surely protect me from those sacrilegious traitors in souls. Wow. Wow, I have no idea what's ahead for Mr. Charles Chinaquai. All right, brothers and sisters, that concludes chapter 48. We will go to chapter 49 here in a short bit. Oh, keep your eyes on Jesus, brothers and sisters. Your nose in the book, which is the Word of God. And embed the Word of God upon the tablets of your hearts so you will not sin against God or be deceived. Till next time. Till next time.